Bonjour à tous, je m'appelle Marco, je suis tellement contente parce que maintenant nous avons un special guest, Robert Tui. Hi Robert! Oh, I messed it up. <laughs> Bonjour Marco, comment ça va? <laughs> I had a whole ruse I was going to do where je, je parlais seulement français, mais maintenant uh, je, je faisais uh, an error and now we're speaking English. Robert actually is, is an American, <laughs> American conductor uh, who lives in France and works in France. Thanks so much for wanting to be here, Robert. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's okay. great to see you again. Uh, of course. So the last time we were together, actually, you were the conductor for my final, my final like live performance uh, of Macbeth, which was a super pleasure. And it was a really great, great experience. And we were just talking before about, you know, living in, in Limoges for two months and speaking French and, and just the whole experience. It was my first like international gig and my last subsequently, but, but it, <laughs> but it was really fun to, you know, be there. And I actually think that in a lot of ways, this is kind of special for me just because, you know, my life has changed so much since 2019, obviously. And of course we had the pandemic and everything like that, but I'm just so thrilled that you wanted to come on this, this baby that I somehow managed to accidentally <laughs> give birth to last year. And, uh, and this is, this is the, what episode four of this having non gamers, even though you do, you do play a little bit of video games, come on and, and listen to video game music. So I'm excited to torture you here with a bunch of really interesting pieces that I, I'm really excited to talk with you about. So I'll yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Very of happy. course, of course. And now, of course, now I, I'm pretty sure, I don't want to take credit for it, but I'm pretty sure when I was there in France, uh, I introduced you to the Nintendo Switch. Is that correct? That is true, uh, because you had traveled to France with your Nintendo Switch. Yeah. And I can't remember exactly how we started talking about it, but you sort of, you basically told me what the system was and that uh, it's, you know, both a handheld thing and also you can plug it into your, you know, yeah, and sort of, and uh, and I thought it sounded so interesting, and it, it eventually ended up uh, getting one. And then the following year was this um, was obviously the, the start of the pandemic, and so suddenly, you know, uh, those of us in the performing arts, you know, we, we had like you know months and months of work, you know, kind of cancelled, and a really it was a very strange period. And so it was, uh, you know, the, the chance for me to sort of explore it a bit more and you know, fall in love with a couple of games and it was really, you know, it, it helped me through a difficult period. Yeah. And so, and, and we were talking earlier that you have played through Dark Souls 3, Elden Ring, and, and obviously you have experience with the Nintendo, uh, the original Nintendo systems. And then obviously now with, you're going to take some time off after this and play Tears of the Kingdom. So that that's pretty much your, like the gamut of your video game knowledge. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like because uh, I mean, I played when I was a kid. We had the you know the Super Mario Brothers, you know, mm -hmm. came out the, and these and then a little bit later on, uh, my parents had a Nintendo Wii, and uh, so I used to I loved playing Mario Kart with my sister when I'd come back from you know mm -hmm. look at in Europe basically now for kind of twenty years, um, but you know we would have a lot of fun every time we would see each other again and sort of get a little bit back into that world. But really, then I started playing a little bit more, and I like games in general. I mean, I love play, you know, I love playing chess. I love board games, society games, mm -hmm. and, and uh, but starting in 2020, we had a little bit more time on our hands, and uh, so yeah, I dipped in with um, with uh, Breath of the Wild, which uh, because I loved the Legend of Zelda game, you know, w when I was a kid, yeah. and I couldn't believe, uh, you know, how you know incredible this universe is. You know, this reimagined universe from a, from a few years ago became, and then, and then, yeah, and then Elden Ring, I guess I sort of heard, I, I heard that there was this major game sort of coming out, and obviously I didn't know anything about these sort of Souls games or anything. Uh, <laughs> How hard I, they are, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, do, I just knew this <laughs> reputation that, like, they're, yeah. they're maddeningly impossible, and they're these difficult bosses, and and so uh, I ended up, uh, yeah, I, I ended up uh, downloading it. And it took a little while to sort of get conversational with how it works because, it, I mean, it's, it's a pretty overwhelming thing. But actually, you know, it really ended up enjoy enjoying that. And that's why I, uh, I did play Dark Souls uh, 3 as well afterwards. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, I have to say that Elden Ring is, is surprisingly Wagnerian uh, in terms of its scope and its depth, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think because also it has this um, the the storyline because they had G.R.R. Martin working mm -hmm. on it, mm -hmm. and uh, 
because he, you know, from obviously a lot of Game of Thrones, uh, you know, fans all you know know who he is, and and that's really kind of why I wanted to play the game because I love the the series yeah. most, right? And the first few books of the series, and there is that sort of like mythical mythological element to it. These sort of mm-hmm. like archetypes, and you know, and uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Did you tune into the music a lot when you were playing it? The of oh, Elden Ring. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the score was good for 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 Elden Ring. With a couple a couple parts in particular, um, I remember that um, uh, the the Malekith sequence is fantastic. I thought yeah. Yeah. there yeah. there were a few bits that are really excellent. I thought it had me sort of thinking that is maybe video game music has some things in common with sort of film music yeah. in the sense that. Uh, whether or not it's sort of like background or foreground, it sort of, it depends a lot on the context. Like mm-hmm. sometimes a great film composer is just, is not sort of like center stage, but it's just sort of helping make the, the, the ambiance right for, um, for what's happening. And then sometimes it has to sort of like, kind of like John Williams style or whatever, the music really becomes center stage. Mm-hmm. And I kind of had that feeling in Elfric that's, you know, sometimes you notice it, sometimes you don't, and, but it was always, it was very well judged to the situation. Yeah. The levels are really interesting. And I think it really goes into, this is the longest intro ever, but it's okay. <laughs> One of the funny things about Elden Ring and video game music in general is actually I'm creating this script, which it won't be out before this video called our video games, modern operas. And, uh, and the reason why I think that is because when you look at the way that's the structurally, yes, yes. Opera, obviously, we require singing by definition, so that is a given. However, when you look at the through line of the structure, actually, music is like inherently important throughout all of the context because there's no simple video game music. It's all programmatic. It's all intentioned. It's all even ambient music is depicting the ambiance of an environment. And so what ends up happening is that you basically have everything unless it's intentional, just like an opera, as you know, um, there are these moments that it's all music related and it exudes music. And that way I feel like it's different than film because film, there are key moments where music exists. Whereas an opera, I really think that the drama and the music are moving at the same time. It's fascinating. Um, and, and I really do think that they are weirdly intrinsically connected, uh, which is really crazy. Yeah, that is that is, uh, that, that, that is that is very interesting. I, I sort of found it to be. Um, I was quite surprised when I sort of like you know restarted uh, you know pl- playing a little bit to feel these sorts of like um, based on some sort of like sound cue. Oh wait a minute, what's going on here? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You feel that the, the the story is sort of you know the trajectory has changed a little bit, especially in these open world games where basically you can go you know. Well, right, yeah. Back, back, back. And then so sometimes that, <laughs> yeah. that little sound cue is, is quite important. Like, oh, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Um, let's dive in. I have a bunch of a bunch of selections for you from all sorts of different angles of the video game world. We've got some hardcore rock. We've got some Parisian uh, Hank cafe music. We've got some lots of orchestral wow. music uh, since that's where, you know, you, that's your bread and butter. And then we also have a lot of vocal music. So we'll dive right in. Um, this is, let me send it to you. This is gravity rush Two. a red apple fell from the sky. Cool, 
Can you hear that in like a like a back back alley like French cafe like something about that accordion I don't know what's your vibe from that <laughs> I mean it's totally well, it's a super interesting sort of like mix of different uh, you know yeah the the accordion especially at the very beginning that definitely has this sort of Parisian <laughs> cafe sort of like vibe yeah. I've never heard so much accordion in my life as uh, as I have in the past <laughs> <Yes>. you know, <laughs> Ten years since, uh, since since I've lived here, because there's the yeah this whole tradition of like musette uh, sort of, uh, sort uh. of music, but also uh, you know the accordion plus the sort of like you know the sort of small jazz combo the you know it's just a really interesting sort of mix of all you know of, of a few different influences. Nice. Yeah. Also, the way that uh, that particular singer articulates the words, and I believe that that's that's Japanese uh, or, or, or it's like Romanji. So the the I, I can't remember all the details, but essentially, like I love the way that there's um, you know because we always talk about in singing this like paying attention to the diction and using the words as like springboards and all this other stuff. And I feel like that particular song when I listened to it, I was like, whoa, that's like really good diction you know what i mean and it's like a really like it actually exudes i have no idea what the hell that song's about honestly but but it, it like exudes a sort of like ex exuberance yeah you know? i uh i saw halfway through that i had i actually had some um uh, a translation pop up in my in my youtube but i only noticed it halfway through the song so <laughs> so yeah yes but i what i thought was super cool is like they're you know the the music of that like the sounds in that language sort of lend itself so well to you know practically like the voice becomes kind of another instrument with this you know with the yeah. clarinet and the yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and uh, and I like that that scene too in between you know super well sung but also that has this almost a slightly instrumental kind of like uh, feel to it it's uh, yeah. improvisation. Yeah, that's a fun. That's a fun little tune. Anyway, that was a soft entry point. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so the next, yeah, yeah. The next track is from um, Zeno Gears. This is an older game, um, and okay. this is called "We the Wounded Shall Advance into the Light," and it's actually from the revival disc. So I'm not entirely clear on if whether or not it was in the actual game, but I think it's, it's like a variation on what was in the game. And uh, I heard this and it's, it's truly like, I'm very curious to hear your perspective on it. Um, it it's, it's sublime. And um, yeah. It's called Xenogears. 
Mm -hmm. Xenogears, yes. And subsequently, actually on the Nintendo Switch, there's Xenoblade Chronicles 1, 2, and 3. Uh, 3 just came out, and they're very, very... They require a lot of time, but they're the the sort of natural evolution from what Xenogears was. This was in the this came out on the PlayStation in like 1990 and something. That's yeah. <laughs> it's stunning, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, and super. <laughs> really, not what I was expecting. <laughs> to, to, uh, yeah. You know, it's incredible. There's all there's so many talented people working in these. You know, work, working in this universe, and just the amateurs of like different colors and you know textures and sound worlds. It's really it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And so that's from a revival. So, so I don't actually know like what, if what that song is in context per se, but, or or what it sounds like in the, in the video game, I'm sure it didn't sound like that when it came out, but there is something so 
just like heavenly about that. And like such a solemn prayer that you would hear in any type of choral, you know, a typical choral setting now even. Yeah. I, I do. I do wonder what the context is because it's the, just in terms of like the acoustic and obviously, the, you know, this sort of choral thinking is it's practically something you could hear in a, in a church somewhere that kind of, right. Uh, in that right. Yeah, really, really, really lovely stuff. Uh, this track is from Xenoblade Chronicles. It's the main theme. Uh, this is actually from Xenogears came first, and then Xenoblade Chronicles one, two, and three. And then there's actually you know there's the whole there's another one on the Wii U, the Xenoblade Chronicles X, but that hasn't been ported over to the Switch. And so so this is actually on the Nintendo Switch. Um, it's a beautiful main theme. It's super well. You'll hear it, but but I just wanted to present it to you. Do you play piano? I forget. Are you a pianist also? Actually, my main instrument was the trombone. I do play oh, piano. It's uh, <laughs> a very unlikely instrument for for a conductor. Yeah, uh, yeah you don't see that often. That's hilarious. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, there there ha- there have been a few, but I I play uh, piano basically in order to learn music. You know, in order to yeah. you know learn scores and, and of course uh, and if it's, especially for for learning opera, it's probably the most useful instrument because you can sit down play it sing each role, try and get further into it. You, you don't pull out your trombone and just find the pitches. <laughs> you know, there's great music for the trombones in his operas, but it's just less per- pertinent for the trombone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, let's check out this main theme. I think, uh, I think from an yeah. emotional perspective, I, I'm again, there's always that, that, that cluing into what's happening and this is the main theme, right? So the main theme, you know, is, is, is an overture. It, it's describing what the experience will be like, and it usually sets the tone for the emotional journey of a piece, uh, not dissimilarly to any overture that, you know, we know. Um, but yeah.
what a musical journey. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely have guessed either uh, a sort of main theme, like basically. Answer. Um, or end titles, basically. Yeah. It's like uh, setting the scene sort of quality. It's weird how a book ends like that too. You know, it has that beginning with the very simple three notes and then we end it's, that's a very like classical method of finishing. I mean, we hear that often, don't we? Like where something starts one way and ends the same way, or do you feel like that's like a very. Yeah, for sure. I think also if, if a composer is trying to tell us that there's some sort of like, um, you know, to describe this sort of like this sort of journey, this idea that you, you go somewhere and somehow you very often end up kind of back in a way where you started, except that you're not the same because of what you've experienced in the middle. So, uh, so this can be really incredibly effective in, you know, and like opera composers use this all the time. Symphonic composers use this all the time where some sort of idea that we heard earlier in the piece, when, you know, when it comes back, it uh, doesn't have the same, you know, it doesn't operate the same role, you know? Yeah. Well, and I, I think a lot of, oh, sorry. Yeah. And this composer, it feels like it was sort of going for a little bit, something like that. When we hear this, this theme again, after this really, this, this, uh, this more kind of more climactic music in the, in the middle, it's really, we have a, you know, a, a different feeling about what we just heard. Yeah. Yeah, I find it doesn't it doesn't feel uh, it doesn't feel shallow. There's a real depth to the sort of arch of that. You know what I mean? Like it really, really is like emotionally. I personally like I feel like it really like it tugs at like you know the the soul and kind of like it's like oh my goodness, like you know, it's like Puccini Puccini lyrical writing in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm sure that there's some uh, that, that there is some heart. I don't know what the story of that of that game is, but I'm sure that there's uh, there's there's something emotional to it because otherwise the, <laughs> the uh, you know the composer would write that if you know if there wasn't some element of that in, to the story. Right, right. Well, now for something completely different. Uh, there's a famous saying in the Ace Combat world which is a fighter plane game. Uh, if the sky or seas speak Latin, you're in trouble. And so this is the first of actually a, basically a three, a three piece symphonic movement called the Alicorn trio. Alicorn is the name of a nuclear submarine. However, this is the first one. Uh, and well, I think you'll, you'll hear what I mean. <laughs> when we get there uh but it, but this this music surprised me uh, when i first listened to ace combat music i was like this is about like a, a a fighter plane game like what could what could possibly be moving about this but uh wait and see you, you'll be i think i think well i don't want to uh, you know i don't want to influence your judgment you'll see we'll see
So actually, this is the third of the series of the Alicorn Trio. This is the last one. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's that's a pretty surprising journey. Well, actually, the, the beginning of it, I was more or less sort of what I was expecting, kind of like action, like almost action movie sort of music. Yeah. The uh, the Latin chorus bit was not what, absolutely not what I, where I where I thought that was going, and um, yeah. that, that, that was that was a very interesting turn of events. You know. Yeah. The beginning, I was hearing a you know a little bit of uh, almost that kind of that, that, that's the sort of thing that, that made me uh, make a little bit that connection between what some film music composers do and maybe what some uh, interesting to know the overlap. I'd, I'd like to know how many composers work for both film and uh, and video games, or you know, I'm sure that some of it has to do with sort of like networks and, you know, what's your sort of professional circle or whatever. Mm -hmm. but I was definitely hearing a little bit of uh, Hans Zimmer uh, influence at the, at the very, very beginning. And then it takes an unusual turn. Honestly. So it's funny. Keiki Kobayashi is the composer and, and, and he, he worked on quite a few um, uh, Ace Combat games actually. And uh, what's amazing is that he's the only composer I've heard that is able to take something that we in the classical music industry recognize as a very common theme using Latin lyrics to explain a, an emotion or a feeling or, you know, the DSA or whatever. And he takes like Steely Dan or like Doobie brothers, or like he takes guitar. There's another track in here that's drag racer. That's literally blues guitar. And then it shifts into this orchestral, like I almost played it for you because it's just like, like you see the like blue sky and it's like you fly out. It's like, but, but the this particular thing feels like it could be a modern day requiem. Like we could take all these instruments, put them in a symphony hall, and somehow all the Latin components of this just, you know, it's weird. Yeah, yeah I think he's, uh, I, I, can, I can see where this guy, you know, it, maybe this is sort of his strength is to sort of really mix different, uh, you know, different elements from different sort of like sound worlds to come up with something that is really very very uh, surprising to like the first yeah. for first listen i know i know uh good that was the reaction i was hoping i'd get um okay um so uh, i have a uh, well we have so many tracks but uh, i want to shift to something a little bit more interesting a little bit a little bit off the beaten path in turn but very different from what I, I think you may be used to. This is a game that I don't, I haven't played, uh, but it's 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 very beloved, and the music is well. You'll see. Uh, this is called Tenebre Rosso Sangue from Ultra Kill, and uh, yeah, I, I play this for a lot of people because it's it's nuts, uh, and it's it's definitely gonna, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ultra Kill, you're going through like the different layers of hell, I believe. And in this particular fight, you're fighting Gabriel, the Archangel.
<laughs> that is pretty funny. <laughs> Were you? <laughs> I guess my favorite part of this is the in the entrance of the organ right after after the you know the piano intro at the. It's really, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Was that too jarring? Was that like too far out of your like comfort zone? Or do you feel like, like what I like about that is it reminds me of like, you know, like books to Hooter or like, you know, like a Bach to Kata or something, no, but, but, but also like totally nuts. Because it's, that's, but, but that's it. As soon as the organ starts playing, then suddenly we get this sort of like, you know, you know, you know, heaven and hell sort of like combat yeah. sort of like, uh, you know, feeling, feelings going on. And yeah. I guess this is, uh, yeah, it's all right. Our, 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 our red blood sort of, uh, you know, sort of feeling. Where's that rank yeah, of, like, yeah. your favorite? Uh, is that is it anywhere in your, like, wow, I want to listen to that more, you think? Or do you feel like that's more like, mm, I think I could do without? <laughs> well, I, I, it's kind of hard to, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I would need to know the kind of the context in the game, you know, it's a, because, yeah. uh, I think very often, uh, you know, what really what what makes something effective or not is like kind of like how, you know, how we feel when we arrive at a certain moment in a you know, a, in a game. Sometimes it's kind of like, but I, I guess I feel like this about uh, about pretty much everything. I remember taking a, a, a class in, or t- not exactly a class, but a sort of like a um, a sort of wine tasting, sort of like exposition, sort of uh, sort of thing. And this this guy, who was this real, you know, absolute wine expert, was saying that for him, uh, the idea of what is really a good wine is kind of difficult to answer because it depends a lot on the context. What would be a good wine if you're, like, let's say you're at like a three-star Michelin, uh, you know, mm-hmm. dinner? That's not going to be the same good wine as if you're having a picnic out, you know, uh, in a park with your friend, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's... <laughs> The, the wine that is perfect for the picnic might be, you know, quite a bit more sort of like simple. It won't, won't have the same alcohol content. It won't be the, the, the flavors might, it, it would, it might just be really very different, but it is the perfect wine for that situation. Mm-hmm. And add this, you know, if you, if you had something that was out of context in either situation, it wouldn't be quite right. And I think, you know, music in general is, is quite like that. I mean, uh, for for sure, film music is uh, is like that. Sometimes a composer can just get it right. Mm-hmm. This is what we need for this, you know, for this moment. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be like a you know, like a Beethoven symphony or something like that. It's just the, exactly the perfect thing for what we need. What you need, yeah. Although you make an interesting point because I remember when I first listened to Madame Butterfly that, you know, it ended up becoming one of my favorite operas. When I listened to it in undergrad, I remember sitting there being like, oh, this is so boring. And then I saw it and I was like, oh my God, this is so good. You know, and it was like nothing changed. Just the context, just seeing it. Uh, so, but what did you feel changed? What it, was, it, was it just because you said you were seeing the story in the theater and kind of following the yeah. <clears throat> once I, once I saw, like, I never thought that the music was bad, but it's like, you know, for instance, the act one love duet is so long that if you don't see it yeah. like physically, it, it's sort of like in a way you're bra- you kind of like inherently check out, like we're not programmed and you know, the general audience is not programmed to sit there and listen to something. I mean, let's be real. How many of us have sort of, sort of dozed off at a symphony? Yeah. It doesn't mean it's not beautiful. <laughs> But, but no, if it's, if it's like a context and you see something then, and I think that that's why, you know, using visuals for video games is really helpful because it's like, oh, well, I know exactly what's happening in that moment. And it's much more impactful. Um, But I, but I do like to try to be a purist about it too, because I think it's good to like uh, create a scenario in the mind's eye rather than just relying on the visual, because we are such a visual society these days, you know? Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. And I also think, that, uh, going back to what you said about uh, Butterfly, but I sort of had a pretty similar experience in that, um, you know, when I started listening to, to Puccini, he was not, I, I, I liked his music, but he wasn't one of my favorite composers mm-hmm. until I started having the opportunity to go and see, uh, see his music live more. And yeah. then I started to understand 
and just at what point he is really a super dramatic genius in in a similar sort of way as like um, in a really good movie, the film director, you know, working with his editors and wherever, wherever will get this to the point where you are the rhythm of the film is exactly it feels you are exactly where you should be at each moment. And there's every moment is either leading to something or sort of like yeah. coming back. <clears throat> from sort of, and Puccini was such a master of that. And it took me um, it, it took me a while to to kind of come to grips with that uh, with that uh, element of him that I I guess I didn't fully appreciate when I started to learn his music basically by listening to CDs and then going into the theater and I realized it was uh, a, a totally different. Uh, well, I think I think Wagner is the same. I mean, I think you know that Gesamtkunstwerk yeah. idea really, really leans in with both those guys. I think, and I and and you know, in thinking about that, like I think the Belcanto guys are a little bit more like, okay, well, this is like I, I just predictable. I understand what's happening. I understand it's a very nice music, and you know, obviously, the goal of us as performers and, and musicians is to elevate that experience so that it isn't uh, necessarily you know, well, you can't prevent something from being boring, but you can ideally make it so that it's interesting in a modern context. But something about Puccini and, and Wagner, especially those two, you know, I feel like they really lean on that because I'm like the total work idea and that like performance storytelling thing. And the Verismo guys in general, I think too, you know. Yeah, and Puccini, he had the, I mean, that's one of the really exciting things about Puccini for me anyway, is that there is this sort of, uh, he was quite influenced by Wagner. He had this yeah, yeah. From, from Verdi in the Italian tradition on the one hand, but then also this other, you know, Wagner with these light motifs that are associated with such and such mm -hmm. a character or idea or something that keep coming back and transforming. And uh, Puccini really did understand how to take that idea and sort of appropriate it into his own music and his own, his own style. Yeah. And then ended up influencing tons of other composers as well. And, we see that that same sort of like Wagnerian light motif thing. It's one of the reasons that I think those first uh, Star Wars movies work so well is that That's John Williams point. really knew how to uh, to appropriate that same uh, that same idea in a way. And, um, uh, I'm sure you've seen these videos on that some of them that exist on, on YouTube where somebody took takes a scene from Star Wars and you watch the scene without the <laughs> without the door. <laughs> And some of them are absolutely hilarious. And we realize that like, at one point he was really doing a lot of the filmmakers' work. Um, yeah. <laughs> not exactly for him, but that, that they were really working together and that it has a, a huge impact on the emotional response to uh, to watching the film. Well, it really <laughs> needs it. it. The, throne, the throne room scene, right? At the, end <laughs> of, uh, at the end of A New Hope. I mean, without John Williams, there is nothing <laughs> happening uh, in this scene. There's Everybody's just walking in silence. He's walking and out, yeah. Forwards, people clap at some strange moment, you know. And the, the music is just the most triumphant sort of like. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The triumphant march, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely amazing. He really, he really made the scene. Um, well, I think uh, that's actually a pretty interesting segue because um, the next piece I want to show you really relies heavily on the context. And, uh, and I think that we got some visuals here for in the balance from final fantasy 14. Uh, this is music by uh, Masayoshi Soken. Final fantasy 14 is a, do you know what an MMORPG is? So it's a massive multiplayer role-playing game. And essentially these okay. are, this was based off of final fantasy, which is can't believe it's celebrating 35 yeah. years and it's been around. It's not so final anymore. Uh, they called it final fantasy because it was their last ditch effort to, uh, re, you know, do something and they were able to re, it, it worked out really well. And subsequently now we're coming out on 16 is coming or is out depending on when someone's watching this. And uh, so in the balance is actually, this whole sequence, this takes place in the, uh, there's raids that you can play with 24 people. And this particular track in the balance uh, tells the story essentially of one of the gods of the realm. And it's sort of the celebration of, uh, of the deities of this, of this world.
it's hard because yeah. that song is such a banger that I want to listen to the whole thing every time because it's just like it's like such a moving track. But but you see you see how much is going on and like how it really the music is essential to aiding that sequence and like this is the god of money and wealth and you know balance and things. Yeah, it has this, uh, and so, so the, the images that we're seeing are are pretty much the images from the game. Where in game, yeah, this is where it plays in game, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's you know obviously composer is going for something super sort of like explosive in terms of like uh, a, a real sort of like a rival moment, uh, you know, an arrival moment. Yeah. And so you have tons of elements, like sort of rhythmic elements, and this is, uh, and I guess it's if it's multiplayer as well, you've got tons of people participating in the same in the same battle. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, 24 people. And also, too, it's also really fun because in the background, you hear coins jingling, jingling in the background. And so we're using like different elements to create like sequences of, of music and instrumentation and stuff. It's it's fun. And it's, it's a sort of this galvanization piece. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Yeah, that's true. It does have that sort of element of like fun to it as well. That's mm -hmm. not the, so, uh, well, so some games that are you know, kind of take on more seriously that sort of like epic kind of like uh, there's the, there's not that feeling at all in like the Elden Ring soundtrack, for example. <laughs> <laughs> you know. No, so, no, no galvanization. Yeah. You, know, you know, Elden Ring is a super fun game to play. It's just, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. Fun yeah, but it's not exactly uh <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. Um speaking of Elden Ring, let's check out. So you don't know Bloodborne at all, and I'm really excited about this because this is one of the No, uh, I heard it was fantastic. I mean, I absolutely loved Elden Ring. And uh so then I read a little bit more about these like Souls games, uh, you know, and how insane people get about them. And I heard that uh, you know, uh Bloodborne is amazing, but yeah, you know, I don't have the right console. So Yeah. Uh, the Gearmon, the first hunter here is incredibly powerful and, uh, it's probably, I've seen it actually, it's been performed uh, in concert, um, in, in for, uh, I think it was, uh, Alice Tully Hall or not Alice Tully. I'm sorry. Um, uh, what's, uh, what's the big one in the UK? Uh, uh, what in, uh, in, in London. London. The, there's the Royal Albert Hall. There's the Royal yeah, Festival. yeah, Royal Albert Hall. So it's been played at Royal Albert Hall. They did like a video game night, which I have my trepidations about like video game night. We can actually get into that in, in, a, in, a, in a little bit because I have a, a, some thoughts on that. But but so this is a very, you'll hear it. And, and I think it'll really, obviously, you know, that Bloodborne is very heavily influenced by HP Lovecraft. And there's, you know, gothic Victorian elements to this. It's, it's, it's a wonderful game. Yeah.
you know, one thing about this music and about um, that, I, I would I'd say the same thing about the Elden, the Elden Ring soundtrack is that it makes me want to know more about the character about whom we're, <laughs> we're with whom we're interacting because <clears throat> you can feel that there's something to that story. Why is, you know, why is this person here? The And also the, the fact that the, in these games, well, these are obviously incredibly well constructed uh, games. Things are never as black and white as just some. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the, the I, I thought this was super interesting about the the Elden Ring story. And every time I've, I've played the game a, a bunch of times, and uh, because obviously, once you, the first time it takes you a long time to play it, second time it takes you a lot less because you know exactly where to go and what to do. And every time I had to to confront Malaketh, I kind of felt bad. <laughs> we, we we quite like him. We feel bad for him, you know. About uh, so anyway, I, that, that this sort of gave me uh, similar sorts of vibes in the sense that I'd like to know more about this uh, this, this character. Yeah. Well, there, it, it just does really have this like tragic plaintive quality about it. That it's anguish. There's a lot of anguish. I think uh, son- sonorally, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's the, you know, yeah, something about the sort of the texture of the strings. Then when the, you know, when we get the vocal writing in as well, there's, you know, it's it's tugging on those, uh, on the, on those sentimental strings. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, I know. It's, it's yeah, a yeah, that's a, good, that's a good track for me. I put that on the top of the list of what we chose. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> They'll be happy to hear that. Uh, <clears throat> also, Robert, uh, just just checking since we just crossed just crossed an hour. Are you okay to go for a while longer? Like another, yeah, yeah, sure. but, right. uh, let me see. One, two, three, four. Five. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Probably I'd, I'd say like seven or eight more tracks. It's always hard because I have to narrow down. And then people, people in the comments usually are like, how come this wasn't in it? And I'm like, it's two hours. What am I going to do? I can't only do so much. Can't miss everything. But I know, uh, but, you know, people are like, why would you introduce them to this? Like based on your reaction to ultra kill, the, the other track, I'm not going to play you this. Uh, um, the, the only thing they fear is you, which is like hardcore heavy metal for six minutes. Like, I don't feel like that's going to be a piece that you're into unless you want to listen to it. Uh, you know, hey, uh, you know, I, I defer to your expertise in this, uh, in this map, you know, <laughs> me, you know, the, you know the thing, and uh, we'll listen to, you know, whatever you want to listen to but for sure i guess the i the thing about the i well it's man now i really want to say bloodborne (laughs) 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 it's such a shame this thing about these different consoles or i know surely you can find a playstation 4 somewhere in paris yeah probably like you know uh, you know but uh you know, I don't, uh, I spend, you know, the, most of the time that I'm not kind of studying music, either playing chess or now, now I've got tears of the kingdom and that's going to be, I mean, that's uh, the thing. Yeah. Bloodborne, hopefully, ho- you know, hopefully someday it'll come to at least the PC. And if you need to, you can grab like a, a laptop and just play it, <laughs> sit down, maybe, yeah, maybe in like, but I, I could also see that those, uh, that that's its own sort of like little universe, those sort of like souls games things. And I, I, and, uh, I could see sort of getting into it because I did really, you know, I, I did like the universe and then uh, going in, back and, up and playing Dark Souls 3 after was, uh, uh, I felt sort of prepared kind of for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a mindset. It's a mindset game. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then I took a stab at uh, Sekiro. Oh, and, God. <laughs> and not good, good enough to, I, I got about halfway through and was just like, I'm going to have to get better before I <laughs> Did you stop at, where'd you stop at the ape? Um, uh, no, I stopped at the, the rooftop guy, the guy who, who, uh, who was, uh, it's, he's the same guy we meet at the very beginning who chops off our arm. Oh, Oh, General Chiro Asana. Yeah. Yeah. General something. Like that. So, oh, on the, on the rooftop. Yes, 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 yes. With the lightning. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't even know how far I am into the game. Maybe about like a, a third of the way through the game. I, I don't know. That. I've never been, I've never beaten it. Uh, it's too so, hard. It's too hard. Life's too short. I mean, 
it's it's fantastic, and it's 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 on my bucket list. One day I'll come back and I'll you know <laughs> come back and like, yeah. <laughs> One day, one day I'll come back and finish what I started, but I don't know how I'm going to get good enough to, you know. <laughs> yeah, that is, I, I found that to be super interesting because that is just like absolutely, unequivocally a skill issue. Uh, <laughs> where, where, where it's, one of the thing that's great about Elden Ring is that you can there's all there's there's always a way. You know. Yeah, there's so many builds. I know. Yeah, <laughs> Sekiro. Yeah. If you hit a wall, it's your fault. You know. <laughs> like it's- yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just like you know, it's just really having to sort of get better. But then it also becomes a question of like, you know, you know, we only have so so much time. It would take a, you know, I'm sure it's it's doable, but it would take me a lot of time. You know, that's like with what time? Yeah, we, we've we've all got stuff to do. Yeah. Uh, so this next track is uh, something that was really interesting to me when I heard it. This was from a a character that a lot of people were excited in the Genshin impact community. This is called uh Polumnia Omnia. And um, I don't want to give away too much context, but the theme is really, really effective. So it's really interesting. So uh, in Genshin impact, it's, it was a mobile game. It's on PC, it's on PlayStation. And um, it, what's really interesting to me is that the bad characters they're called the Fatui Harbingers and they all have Comedia de Larte names. So this particular track is about a character named Scaramucci or Scaramouche. And all the the, the head of it, Dottore, um, Pantalone, Capitano, La Signora, um, you know, uh, Tartaglia, it's crazy. And it's it, we're only starting to unravel more as time goes on. It's a fascinatingly deep game. I did a whole video on like breaking down, you know, what, what even Italian Comedia dell'arte is and stuff. So in this particular track, something has occurred with Scaramouche and um, I just, yeah, I'm really curious to hear your, did I ever send it to you? Your perspective. Oh, <laughs> 
Yeah, interesting, uh, interesting sort of like east west mix to it. In mm -hmm. you know, all this all this percussion is 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 really super fun. Sort of vaguely eastern sounding kind of you know flute like uh, sort of things. Very, very yeah, cool cool track. Do you hear Do you hear the sort of Mozartian Bach? This uh, yeah, it's sort of the melodic patterns that kind of uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that harken back. This is kind of yeah. I guess that's what I mean, sort of by the more sort of Western element. Western, These yeah, very clear sort of like melodic uh, patterns that are being followed by. It's, it's a really funny thing because Genshin Impact, I think in a lot of ways, is the truest sense of the evolution of classical music in a, the most traditional way speaking. Like when I think I've listened to a lot of the tracks and I've played a lot of the game. And what's really fascinating is that we, so you clued into the Eastern portion because this character Scaramouche is, uh, is from Inazuma, which is their representation of Japan. And so those themes wow. that you hear are actually a related, uh, they're light motives from Inazuma. And then you tap in this like robotic quality because he literally is becoming, he's become a false God. And so he steps into this mech, this mechanical giant creature. And uh, he. Sort of like the electro sort of like a, the, the, the electronic. He, sort of influence. His mother is the electro archon or the electro God of Inazuma. Uh, mother in quotes. And then on top of that, you have the singer who's actually the composer, which I love, uh, Yu Peng Chen. The singer, the if you listen, it's actually like it has this leggero tenor quality to it because he's young. And so it's actually like really like plaintive because he's actually deeply sad inside, even though we don't see that when we're fighting him. Because when we're fighting him, we're fighting this giant thing. Uh, and yeah. so, so when you put all that together, it's like it's amazing how all so many of these tracks and right now the region is Sumero, which has a heavy influence, uh, you know, heavy Indian and Persian uh, influence on the music. And there's a lot of like, um, uh, 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 oh my, what's, what's the name of this instrument? Oh my God. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. There's there's a big influence on uh, I can't remember the name. A sitar. There's a lot of sitar in it. There's a lot of drum. A lot of like, yeah. So so it's it's interesting how each region. Mondstadt was all was a German. It's a German town, so it has very German Western influence. Liyue is Chinese, so there's a heavy Chinese musical influence. And now the next expansion is Fontaine. Fontaine means fountain as you know and so there's going to be a huge i actually think we're going to go belle époque france cabaret this sort of like you know i mean the character i played dvorak was a musician from fontaine a composer it's the like the capital of music and art of this of this world and anyway i could gush about it it's a very musically i i think it's it's delicious it's i like that touch there as well that i mean I've, obviously i uh uh I wouldn't have known if, if you didn't tell me that, that, that that's the composer singing, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's a, a nice touch because th there's a certain you know, obviously it's a, it's a nice voice, but it's not a sort of like um, trained fully sort of like trained kind of, and so it has this sort of like uh, fragility to it, which is quite uh, which is touching. It's really, it, uh, it, it serves the material, and that's yeah, it's good to know. That's so that's the guy that wrote the piece. It's funny you say that though, because they created a live version and the uh, singer is an Italian baritone and he's, he's very good, but I came away with it kind of frustrated and, and I've covered it too. And, and my voice, as you remember, is pretty lyric and heavy, it has a darker timbre to it. And, and even mine was much more visceral and, 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 and potent. Whereas Yu Peng Chen singing, like you said, it's very gentle and uh, it almost has a naive quality to it. But I was frustrated with the live performance because they got like a very legitimate sounding opera singer and a lower one at that, which made even it was a, a contextually didn't make, it didn't make much sense to me. And I was frustrated by it because of what you just said, because using that raw quality of a Leggero light tenor that has the notes, but can't necessarily, you know, you know, cause there's something about opera that can, can come across as artificial in the wrong context, as we know. But it's a, it's a, reminds me of what we were talking about earlier about like, it's, it's so much depends on the context, just like a good, you know, a good wine depends on where you are, what you're eating, right. what you're with, what's, you know, what's the, what's the context. So the, the voice that's going to be best, for such and such a situation 
is not necessarily the uh well not always the best singer uh yeah it, it's not necessarily uh you know uh Pavarotti that, uh, that we need for <laughs> yeah you know, it's uh and actually we hear this all the time right because i'm sure you've you know uh we, we certainly won't name any names but uh there's uh, a couple you know pretty well-known opera singers that have decided to sort of like you know do some do some crossover stuff uh, uh be it, you know christmas albums or sort of like jazz albums or something like that john yeah. denver yeah <laughs> with, and with with mixed results because yeah. uh and it, it really depends a lot on what sort of where they come from. Some some uh, opera singers, you know, come from you know, or have some sort of like background in in different kinds of singing, and they can yeah, sure, and, and they can modulate what they're doing. Some others not so much, and so sometimes to hear a sort of kind of life or music song with a sort of uh, uh, a sort of kind of a, an instrument that's a little bit too sort of like. Um, too robust and too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I, so I think I can kind of imagine what you're saying if you heard this uh, the same piece, but with a a more sort of like professionally trained kind of like. Yeah. Uh, like, it just it, be missing something. Yeah, exactly. Even though the the qualifications are there, it's it's a really interesting uh, it's a really interesting parallel and, and phenomenon. Um, speaking of singing. This uh, this is actually from one of my favorite games of all time, and uh, they just announced a remake of it, uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. If you like James Bond, you'll certainly like this. Uh, this is uh, Snake Eater from Metal Gear Solid 3, and uh, they just announced this in a trailer the other day, and when I tell you I, I nearly imploded uh, because it's been some 20 years, 2004 is when the original MGS3 came out. So this is the game of my childhood. What a thrill With darkness and silence through the night What a thrill I'm searching and I'll melt into you What a fear in my heart But you're so supreme
I mean, that is, that is just a straight up banger and absolutely out of the James Bond universe. What a, you know, such a great uh, homage to, to that style, you know, the luxurious orchestration, the, the yeah. vocals. It's just so good. There's just something about that, the way... It, sorry, I didn't mean to cut. I get so excited that I cut you off. Go ahead. No, but it's like, you know, the you know the sister of like the, you know, Goldfinger main theme or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's just something about that. Bum, 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 bum. What a thrill. Oh, it's... <sighs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. That's, that's, that's so good. That's, that's top level. That's great. So that <laughs> game came out, what, that was how many years ago? So it came out in 2004 originally. Okay. And, and so, so you played that, yeah, you, you played that younger, and now they're remaking it. Is that right? So, mm -hmm. just, so now Metal Gear Solid 3. So in, in the fall, they're re releasing uh, the original trilogy because it's actually a trilogy, obviously, uh, MGS 1, 2, and 3. Um, that'll be on Xbox and PC and PlayStation. So you can probably play that actually, if you still have your Xbox. Well, hey, uh, you know, based on the theme song alone, I might have to play. It. <laughs> well, and, and, and solid snake and, and big boss in this case is, uh, you know, snake, uh, snake eater MGS three was the, uh, it was in the past. And so it was, uh, the, the story of how we came to know the character that became solid snake. And there's like sci-fi and espionage and politics and, you know, everything that would define a classic bond movie in this particular game, you have like, you can camouflage yourself and like, you can you, literally, you like walk through the jungle and you're, you know, it's, it's, <sighs> It's so, it's so cool. Uh, anyway, so I just felt like sharing that because shit. <laughs> hey, Matt, I am, uh, I, I am learning all kinds of stuff today. I'm, I'm digging. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, let's switch to something. Um, we've done, so we've had a lot of, uh, Japanese composers actually. And, and sometimes I find it kind of funny because I feel like some, in some cases these days, Japanese composers are doing what Western composers don't really do anymore. Um, I do think that, you know, I do think that Western composers are still innovating, of course. Um, but there is such an enormous prevalence of Japanese composers that write in this Western style that is just extremely, uh, fantastic. Um, is it mostly because so many of these games are being developed, uh, you know, over there? Is that the, is that the reason? Possibly, possibly. I'm not fully, I'm not really positive, but there are amazing composers in the States as well. Um, you know, Austin Winery, uh, Darren Korb, um, you know, all the, the team at Riot or the team at, um, at uh, Bungie that makes Destiny. And uh, so this next track actually is called uh, Jin the Virtuoso which I thought that you might appreciate. Um, and uh, this is from a game called League of Legends. And uh, I'm curious if uh, you'll... Like, yeah, I've, League of Legends. Yeah, I'm sure I've you've heard, heard of it. it. I, I've heard of this. I know it's a huge universe. I, I don't know uh, anything about it.
<laughs> I hadn't heard that in a minute. I, sorry. I hadn't heard that in a minute. That is so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that, that is lovely. That's, so this, uh, this is the character's name, Jin the Virtuoso. Is that right? So of course they have to, you know, they have to. The virtuosic string boy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, because that's what maybe the instrument we most, uh, you know, strongly associate with sort of like virtuoso, uh, you know, virtuoso playing. Isn't it interesting that they choose the gun, the gun cocking and shooting as the instrument in the beginning? I find that a really interesting touch and very, very original. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, that, that is, uh, you know, a shocking little, uh, little, little detail. Nice touch. A lot of you know, it's funny because uh, Jin is apparently a um, a um, serial killer, or he's a sociopath. Like he he, he kills. And uh, actually, this song is not about Jin, which I thought it was. It's actually about his his victims. It's the last thing that they hear essentially before they they die. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or so it was told to me in the comments when uh, when I posted it because I thought it was like oh I feel guilty I'm looking at myself in the mirror I feel this sort of way and everyone was like no <laughs> no but he's a serial killer but the idea is he's the virtuoso he's put, he's he, he it says he, it, yeah it's he's the he's the master the virtuoso of the art of killing essentially mm. I love it when they do this when it flips because you you know because I mean you know you know how it goes you you see you hear something and you're like oh this sounds X therefore it it must be Y but instead it's like when you do a fantastic opera production and instead of the typical like stuff like the Francesco Zimbello the Francesco Zimbello production of Madame Butterfly where the first half takes place in the consulate instead of taking place at the residence of of you know Pinkerton or Church of Saint. like it's it's so. It's so fun when when it subverts your expectations, you know. Yeah, I, um, I I love this when when this when this sort of idea is well done. I would say, but also uh, um, I, I only got to the chance to conduct uh, Madame Butterfly once, uh, but I really loved what the stage directors did with this production. It was a m more modern staging, uh, and in the first half, what the characters were. Basically, it was a more sort of traditional staging uh, of Butterfly um, in traditional costumes. But at the same time as we were watching Act One, we there was a sort of uh, a giant screen all around the stage. And we were seeing sort of like basically sort of mirror images of each uh, character, but sort of more modern day versions. So we were mm. seeing this sort of like this, you know, the more traditional sort of like Japanese version of the story. And then we were also seeing, you know, in France in 2018, sort of like young French characters, the sort of acting out the sort of same story. And then in Act Two, uh, the roles were sort of reversed. So the characters that we had seen filmed in the in Act One, then were the sort of main characters uh, in in the, to continue the story. I'm not sure if oh. I explained that very well. No, no, you but, did. Uh, I'm picturing it in my mind's eye. That's fascinating. So it was, it was fantastic because in, in Butterfly, there's this real, there's such a dramatic change between, you know, what happens in Act 1, ending with the big love duets, and then, you know, uh, Act 2, where he's been, you know, Pinkerton has been away, and she's been mm -hmm. there waiting. This whole sort of like psychological element that comes into, into play. And I love the fact that the stage directors really understood that this is really a, a sort of like a there are really two halves to this story and the second half should be a totally different plan. Yeah. And yeah. That idea of doing so the, the singers all, it was, was quite a long production. The singers all had to come early to sort of film these scenes mm. and do the, and they also brought in a sort of um, a really brilliant uh, uh, movement coach uh, because you had the, the, basically each singer had to sort of play two versions of the same character, one more sort of traditional one and one more, modern day version and you can't walk the same you can't behave the same you can't, it's, everything about it has to change and um anyway yeah so tying into you know something like uh something like butterfly i really very much like this when there's some sort of twist on the story that really changes the way you're you know your perspective of it how you can see it 
Yeah. Well, and you know, it's nice to see that even in 2016, when this came out, you know, we're still like doing that musically too. Like where we're, we're playing with the, with the thoughts and like the experience. Um, let's see. Uh, this is the speaker as, as, as well. This, this sort of, this, this, he's really a virtuoso, uh, you know, killing. Killing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. extremely sort of like elegant, uh, you know, music to be associated with him. Is, it certainly is creepier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it has sort of like Professor Moriarty vibes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, this next track is called This Is What You Are. It's from Warframe by Keith Power, uh, another, I, I believe, American composer. Uh, Warframe is a free to play game on the PlayStation, well, all major consoles. And uh, this particular track I, I love. Um, it is very, it makes me contemplate my existence. Uh, when my dad was really sick, I would go to the gym and I would listen to this music when I was doing like at the time before I had a back injury, I uh, was doing like burpees or something. And I, I would literally listen to this piece and channel like my energy to my dad to like, you know, help heal him in a way. And uh, it's just one of these tracks that really just, I don't, I don't know. And also there's, there's a lot of use of uh, the Arhu, uh, you know, obviously a Chinese uh, instrument and, and it's not something that, I had heard a lot of, and so the Arhu has such an interesting, almost mystical quality to it. And I think that this track uh, really leans on that and the vocalism really, really beautifully. So I'm very curious to hear what your thoughts are on it.
It's really nice. <laughs> I only see why that would make it onto a gym playlist. <laughs> it's, it's really nicely constructed, you know, the, you know, when you get this theme and how it feels so different when you have this more rhythmic, uh, syncopated, uh, you know, percussion mm -hmm. coming. And it's got, uh, yeah, I don't know, there's something about that that has this sort of like meditative uh, sort of like focus to it, right? But uh, I like that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, there's something really profound about that piece. I also really appreciate from a vocal perspective, how um, I really hear obviously because it's in a microphone and stuff, but I really like how I can hear the rawness of the vocalism. Like there's the breath and you feel there's a lot of imperfection in the, and I love that. I love that because it's so raw and real and yeah. honest, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I like this uh, in, in all kinds of music, actually. I don't want it. I think one of the things that's a little bit of a problem with uh, our, maybe the, the, the time in which we live nowadays is that there's so much sort of emphasis on sort of like airbrushing everything, being either yeah. photos or recordings, the same thing. Nowadays, when you go and do a studio recording, it's a lot of it is just, uh, you know, make sure this is together, that this is proper, that this is kind of like, and somehow it's a bit like sort of putting, it can be like putting bleach over everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it kills something sort of really important. And I like, you know, old recordings that have these imperfections in them because it keeps something real despite the imperfections. And I like it in more, you know, in, you know, more modern music when, you can feel that the composer and the artists have some sensitivity to, to, to that as well. And that they get a little bit of this, the, you know, the grain of the imperfections that make the personality. Yeah. Like this, you know, this is a nice piece. I, I, I really like this. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we have about like four pieces left. So I guess this would be a good time. I guess Robert Dui to talk a little bit about yourself and, and, you know, um, where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you've done, you know, the typical CV breakdown, but you know, in a, in a, in your personal yeah. world. Uh, sure. So anyway, I, so, um, uh, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. And uh, we had the good fortune, uh, well, in a suburb of Buffalo, New York, called Clarence, had the good fortune to uh, grow up in a public school system, had a really excellent music program, and really good teachers, and we were all encouraged to take up an instrument around fourth grade, and for me, it, this was just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know bas basically love at, love at first sight, and I kind of knew that I, my future would be wrapped up in music in some way or another. And uh, eventually, yeah, I ended up going to conservatoire in Cleveland, ended up going to study conducting in London, because uh, I kind of had the sense that it was, in, if I, well, once I got really into, into conducting, that it was going to be important for me to live in a big city, basically, mm -hmm. and to hear the best singers passing through, to hear the best orchestras and the best conductors, and uh, London seemed to make sense. And then I needed a job, and... Uh, after after leaving the academy, and uh, was lucky enough to find a job in in Montpellier in the south of France, and uh, yeah, which was pretty much a dream place to live. At, you know, sort of. I guess I had just turned yeah, I had just turned thirty years old, and this was uh, I had been working for a while, like sort of you know small gigs here and there, kind of piecing stuff together. This was my first full time uh, conducting gig of a professional uh, orchestra. I was the assistant conductor in the opera house. Kept that job for a few years and then was hired by a different house, a smaller house in France, but to be the main conductor. And that is where you and I met mm -hmm. in 2019. Yeah, yeah, when you came to, to sing in a production of uh, Macbeth that we did in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Reims uh, as well. Yeah, Reims, Massy, and Limoges, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And... Uh, yeah, so anyway, so I've been living in uh, Europe now since about 2000, I guess 2003, and living in France since 2009, and uh, Paris since about 2014, so it's been a pretty wild ride, and, uh, you know, it's just the last few years have been, you know, particularly crazy. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> 
I mean, I can't. Really good move these days. And this is right when, uh, this is the best time of year to be in Paris. You know, mm-hmm. we've got through the winter, you know, this sort of like gray, gray, uh, kind of, you know, drizzly, rainy sort of stuff. Now, you know, it's beautiful out. The sun is out. This is, uh, you know. You know, so I mean, for those of you that are that don't know, it's it's it is hard to have a career in the music industry, and certainly, you know, Robert. I mean, you've been doing this for so long, and and especially as a conductor, I feel like you know you're touring, you've done gigs, you know, everywhere pretty much in Europe, and you know, do you feel like um, do you ever feel like it's uh gets too hard, or do you still feel like now, you know, twenty years out now, right? It, it still feels really satisfying every day. Uh. It's- it's <laughs> <laughs> put you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really, um, it's one of those fields that has a lot of ups and downs. Right. right. And one of the, it's uh, one of the reasons for that, I guess, is that because w- when we're working on a project that we're really, uh, you know, deeply into and feel very passionate about the highs can be extremely yeah. high. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but this is actually something that I find that's, that's very difficult to kind of deal with because you can't just have these dopamine highs. Every high is followed by a sort of like mm-hmm. crash Hello. down afterwards. Yeah. And it's extremely difficult to em- emotionally to handle this sort of like up and down. I mean, from the outside, I think to some people, it sounds like, oh, it must be all great because you're yeah. passionate about music and you get to, but there's this, um, um, it's something that I, I've been learning qu- quite a lot recently. I've been listening to uh, Andrew Huberman's podcast. I don't know if you ever listened to this the Huberman lab. He's a neuroscientist at, si- at Stanford mm. and he talks, uh, uh, well, he, he takes on all kinds of topics, but uh, one thing that's extremely interesting that he was talking about, he did, uh, you know, an entire episode, you know, like three hours long, just about sort of dopamine in, in mm. and, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and in listening to this, I started to understand a little bit more about the certain frustrations that that a lot of us feel in this field of, about kind of like the you know the highs and the lows basically, and the difficulty of um, uh, of, of sort of negotiating that. And then, of course, there's I mean, every field I guess has its has its ups and downs. But yeah, even YouTube, uh, even voice, sure. acting, voice yeah. acting, YouTube, it has its ups and downs for sure. Yeah, and there's, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I think every field kind of, you know, kind of does. One other th- thing that's very difficult for us, I guess, is that sort of um, that the, the fact that there's sort of no stability. And I guess in this, you know, voice acting, I'm sure, is kind of the same. You're always thinking about your yeah, yeah. your next gig, the thing, you know, there's a you're getting accepted, you're getting rejected. And it's yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. all the time and and learning to sort of. Uh, like in that Rudyard Kipling poem when he talks about sort of treating those two imposters the same, you know, <laughs> success and failure, basically, because it's true. Sometimes something that doesn't go well uh, is actually the, the biggest present you can receive. Yep. And uh, you also have to bear in mind that when everything seems to be going well, like keep a bit of distance with 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 that as well. Yeah, so you don't get, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <clears throat> but I imagine that pretty much, you know, a lot of fields are, are, are like that. But when we were lucky to feel pa- really passionate about what we do, but that doesn't come totally without its price tag, I would say. One million percent. One million percent. Uh, it, it's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon that I certainly remember distinctly feeling with, with opera in particular. And that was really when I realized that, you know, besides my, my anxiety and, and handling, you know, and never feeling like I had arrived, which really frustrated me as a perfectionist and as a person who, who I, I still love opera. I still love to sing when I, when I do. And I still love like, well, I'm doing talking about it right now. We're talking about music. Like I'm so passionate about this music and, mm-hmm. uh, and really the goal of the channel is to really like, uh, not only educate an audience, but also educate in some ways, the classical music world that it can be a little bit stuffy and that there's actually like this wide, you know, sw- like uh, a wide selection of things that are very legitimate, that really are moving people in ways that well, I'm certainly in Europe, I'm sure it's obviously different, but in the United States, as you know, it's like impossibly difficult to educate people or have people even want to go to an opera or symphony hall. And so 
you know, it's funny. I saw a performance of like a, the thing that the thing that kind of frustrates me, even though I'm glad it happens, is that they have these video game music live concerts, which are great. They're packed. I went to one in November in Boston. It was amazing. All music for Final Fantasy. I literally was like a kid in Christmas. It was it was wonderful. Yeah, but yeah. I wish that we would program them in a regular symphony because I actually think that programming would actually draw in a crowd. And I went to this performance. Um, when I lived in DC and the conductor was like, we came to you. Now you come to us. And I felt like that is the complete wrong way to go about this because you you're alienating a a, a huge swath of society. You know, it's just like weird classical versus everything else. It's, it puts up another sort of like, uh, you know, I mean, I kind of get where he's coming from, but it just, it puts up a wall and the wall is unhelpful. Right. uh, it, it, It does sort of make it into, you know, you know, our camp and, and their camp. Your, and I, yeah, right. I, I think the challenge is to, is to figure out ways to, um, to, to erase some of these, like two, um, these sort of, these distinctions that are, you know, that, that, that are too easy in a way just, and mm-hmm. it's, um, I, I remember I did one concert in that, that I was able to program because this was with, with my, with my old orchestra in, mm. in Bosch. And we had the idea to do a, um, a, a film music concert, mm-hmm. which I have conducted uh, a tremendous amount of, but I really, you know, I am passionate about movies and I'm, I'm passionate about the, the role that good music can, uh, yeah. you know, can play in movies. And w- when we were discussing this, uh, eventually we came with the idea of not doing an entire film music concert, but to do a, a um, a concert where we, yeah, we had some film music, but we also had some film music by uh, by a composer who uh, started his career just writing for, you know, orchestra and oh, for the opera, yeah. and also to write uh, and also to include some excerpts from a piece that is not a piece of film music, but that very heavily influenced uh, film music composers. Oh. So I was pretty happy with this program because. That's it, nice. Because then, you know, we had something that you would usually hear only in a concert hall, but also on the same program with uh, with Korngold, who started his career like, mm, yeah, yeah. writing big operas like Die Tote Stadt and, um, and finishing the concert with, uh, with music from John Williams, who was very heavily influenced by both Korngold and by Gustav Holst, who was the other composer of course. that we were talking about. And I was quite pleased with this program because it would have been so much easier in a way to just program all film music. But then we would have had an audience that it would have been a little bit like maybe what that conductor uh, yeah. Mentioned yeah. Was, was talking about. That's like, uh, we're, we did your stuff. Now you come in and hear. Yeah, it. we did your pops. So now, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we wanted to do a concert that was a little bit more like, actually, the, a lot of this stuff is connected. And uh, w- one of the reasons that John Williams is such an excellent film composer is that he's extremely clever about um, uh, assimilating influences from certain composers in order to, 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 to do things to help tell the story. Right. And, uh, you know, I really, I admire his, uh, his music really very deeply. And of course we had to finish the, the concert with the theme or with the, the suite from Star Wars mm-hmm. because you know, of course, I, mean, I, I, grew up, I grew up <laughs> with these movies. And I also thought this was probably, you know, I don't know how many chances I'll get in my career. <laughs> You're sticking it there, it's yeah. <laughs> one of the most exciting things I've ever conducted, you know. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> and for a good part of the orchestra as well, like just even before the, the first chord of the, of the main title, I mean, the smile on everybody's faces. Mm. So, you know, and I think that that is important to have that in the concert hall as well. And I, you know, and I hope that we had, I think we did have a good mix of people in the audience, like some people who came for Star Wars, but also some people who came for the orchestra. And hopefully the people who, who, you know, just came for like to come to a symphonic concert were like, ah, you know, this, uh, it's a big world and there's a lot of good music uh, and there's a lot of different kinds of good music out there. Yeah. 
No, it's true. And actually that's a perfect segue because, uh, this, this particular track, uh, I heard it not too long ago. Uh, monster hunter music is, is not music that I would have guessed would like make me think that it can exist in the symphony hall. Uh, and, but I've really been impressed by many of these tracks and one of them in particular, uh, literally the, the game is called monster hunter. You do what you, what you, what it sounds like. And, um, <laughs> And, uh, and and it's incredible and it really has blown me away so this is actually uh the battle theme for shantian uh phase four of four and again like we're thinking too like when we think about symphonic works we understand that most symphonic pieces have three to four movements and mm-hmm. much is the same with these battle themes where obviously i'm about to play you with like i would say the uh, allegro vivace of the of the, of the theme <laughs> This, this is a dragon. Is that right? Yeah. It seems like this is uh yeah, this is from Monster Hunter G1. And it seems like Shantian has a body structure similar to most Leviathans with gray scales, jade colored crystal like organs around its body, two wing like structures on its back and blue and white for running down its spine. And apparently like it, it seems like tearing apart the airship you're on and then a climactic final showdown. Um, I mean, it's like, it's like a visceral, it's visceral, isn't it? It's like really, really intense. Yeah, yeah, it's got to. It's definitely got that sort of like epic sort of uh, uh, vibe to it somehow. And I guess that's when, when yeah, when 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 you start to get that, uh, you know, the the Hans Zimmer style sort of like syncopated percussion thing going in, it really adds to that sort of like <laughs> massive uh, showdown sort of uh, feeling to it. It's it's funny because a lot of the themes actually, just to give you a frame of reference. Um, uh, a lot of the themes have this very famous, let me see. Can I play in this? monster hunter? You mean 
In Monster Hunter, there's this famous motive called proof of a hero, and it appears in every single uh, track. Now, of course, uh, if you'd like to watch musical motive that appears you know, in every track. Oh yeah, oh yeah, in oh. every in every major boss battle. Uh, oh. I want to play this for you. But uh, I have to make a note to everybody that if you want to watch this, I want to share this with Robert. But the problem is this will get copyright claimed. At least it has in my previous video. So if you want to check it out, go check out the full version. Uh, this will not be in the edited version, sadly. But um, that's my disclaimer. Um, but I just just so you hear it, because I know you love John Williams. And um, I just want to send this to you because I think you'll you'll absolutely go bananas for this. Um, yeah, and uh, I, it, that's true. I do love John Williams, and one of the things I love about him is that sort of like the the light motif thing, you know, yeah. he associating a musical idea with a character, with an idea, with a an I. Well, and proof. Of, there's my dog, by the way. <laughs> well, outstanding. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry if she barks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so proof of a hero, you'll hear why it's called this. You can kind of hear it already. <laughs> It almost sounds like Superman, actually, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Here's the big... Here's the big moment. After every um, flagship boss fight, you, you've got character uh, like Shantian may have it. I, I don't. I, I don't think it does actually. But like, uh, there's a character Safajiva, which is like the enemy of humanity. Fatalis is the enemy of humanity. Like these dragons. Like I think Fatalis literally like hates humans or something like that. If I remember correctly. And so when you're fighting them in that final phase where you have a moment where you may not make it and then proof of a hero comes on and it's like, let's go, baby, you know, fight the fight. And so every time it appears, you know, it like galvanizes people and it's like, yes, yes, I can. You know what I mean? It's so satisfying. Yeah, it, it definitely has that uh, the, a bit of uh, John Williams vibe to it. And yeah. which is just, uh, which is excellent. It kind of like I'll sends see. you off, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. Because and I must <laughs> say for, for John Williams as well, it was like, because um, we, you know, we grew up watching the mm -hmm. movies that he wrote the, and even that now multiple generations. Like for my generation, it was really Star Wars. For my nephews, I see that it's like, I mean, Harry Potter is just the, the yeah. be all and end all. They, you know, and, um, and also yeah, Indiana Jones. I mean, there's just so, so many. Oh, so many. And, so when I finally got the chance to sort of to to do a concert where I had a bunch of John Williams pieces on it and I could finally like look at the scores and actually sort of like study how he wrote it, I was absolutely amazed at how, uh, I mean, I knew that I loved the music, but the detail of what uh, of uh, of what he was asking for and and the way he constri and he constructs it, both in terms of the the themes, but also, you know, certain rhythmic ideas, certain orchestration ideas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, harmonically, like really a, a, a real master. A yeah. Really I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable stuff in destiny Two, which is a game that's been out for like 10 years now, right. Since 2014 with the original destiny, there is um, this amazing uh, idea around using uh action like there's moments of downtime where there's just like drums or whatever and then it moves dynamically into like these main themes um and uh, light motives are all over this this game and so i want to play you uh, really quickly just so you hear the first light motive um from their latest expansion called lightfall um you can literally hear the soprano who's a fantastic trained soprano we've had a really nice chat um this is the main theme of lightfall i just want to play it for you really quickly and then 
shift into this battle ready sequence that if you like Rocky, you'll, you'll hear the, the connections between uh, it's, it's sort of like when you're learning a new power and you're finally like accessing this new ability. Um, it's, it's really cool. So let's listen to Lightfall first here. That's actually a motive right there. That stomping is called the cabal stomp. It's actually an emphasis of a melody for something else. They layer melody really beautifully. Nice That's use of the of the soprano here. Yeah, and they they and actually had a chat with Sky Lewin, uh, the head of the audio direction uh, team, and and one of the composers, if not, I think the lead composer, I believe, and uh, and they talk about how they use soprano, and soprano actually is used almost always when we talk about ethereal. Uh, or like higher plane thinking, which makes sense if you look at like you know voce di what's it called um, from Don Carlo voce di del cielo or I forget uh, the celestial voice, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the celestial voice, and we don't know, but because of course it, this is when you're gonna if you're trying to evoke something this sort of like angelic, uh, you know, sort of lao. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 this kind of element, it does, it does make sense. Um, think of some other, yeah, yeah, that's really, it's really effective. But of course, it's always good when they're trying to, when they're trying to tap into that. It's always going to be a soprano, right? <laughs> <laughs> I asked, I said, why not a tenor? <laughs> he was like, mm. it just because yeah. it ma- it mixes in too much with the other instruments, and so it tends to get lost, which is really interesting. Yeah, it's totally different. But and if it's only an instrumental track, and they're they're going for that sort of like ethereal, uh, you know, like uh, like Vaughn Williams, the lark ascending or something. Yeah. Like oh that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, yeah. it's not going to be uh, a cello, which is more you know closer to you know. 
sort of maybe the, you know, a, uh, a, a tenor voice or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. for, for the sake of uh, showing you line motives and video games. So here's battle ready from the same, from the same expansion uh, of Lightfall. There's that motive, right? But you hear how they take that same whatever that light motive light motive is of of lightfall from the main theme they take it and they thrust it into this and there's also like three other motives in here that you don't know the references to but I do and it's like they they just like are like here put that put that put that and it like it causes this sort of like you know this this feeling of like yeah let's go baby and, and you know what I mean it, it gets you mm. oh yeah but I mean that's a you know that's a something that's super exciting especially once you start to know you know. When you have more of the references, then it's like, oh, for, like in the, um, yeah, what was it? Do you, do you remember? What, how, how old were you when the, when the Phantom Menace came out? Oh God. I was, you I were, must've been like 11. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, uh, I was quite, quite, a, quite a bit older, but I remember when we started to hear some of these, like, you know, these sort of shadows of uh, of themes that we know from you know from from the original trilogy but we could see you know we, we could hear john williams sort of like telling the story about what's going to happen in the sort of next one because yeah. we have the references like this is really yeah. you yeah. know so yeah, yeah i can imagine that the more you know about it the more yeah yeah this feeds it this feeds into it because it's it taps into something that you know already I mean, light motives are such a satisfying, and I, I just love that they really harken back to, even though he wasn't the original create, even though he wasn't the creator of the concept of the light motive, the fact that Wagner, all these years later, we still have this heavy influence by, by the man himself. You know what I mean? And yeah, it was, it was such an incredible, uh, you know, I I incredible idea that's, you know, and that very rightly so many composers realized there's going to be many different ways to, um, you know, to, to develop this or to adapt this sort of, this kind of idea to, to their own personal language. And yeah. Uh, yeah. All we, these years had, later. yeah. Yeah. For, for sure. Um, um, this, you know, Puccini, this is one of the things I, I love about him is that even though it, his music sounds nothing like Wagner, you, you do still get a little bit of this Wagnerian uh, influence. And I just did this piece uh, last month, uh, uh, an opera by a French composer named Massenet on oh, yeah. the called the Cendrillon, which is yeah. for Cinderella. And um, one of the things I loved about this piece is the Wagnerian influence. That once he starts to talk about uh, the fairy godmother, was you know surrounded by these these spirits and the like, then he starts to evoke a little bit the, this sort of sound world of uh, of Wagner oh. to get this kind of otherworldly sort of thing. So, I mean, the, the, his influence was just so uh, incredibly massive. And I think this is the mark of a really great idea when it's, when the idea itself is, is great, but also it can be 
adapted, generalized, uh, expanded, expanded upon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, no, it's, it's crazy that we're still in a time period where they're like composers, whether or not you see them in person or on your screen, the composers are still like borrowing. And I see this more in video games than I ever did in opera with modern compose co- modern compositions. Um, you know, just that like heavy use of light motive as a programmatic storytelling element. And it's like really, really powerful. Um, yeah, 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 for sure. And I think this, uh, uh maybe in, it, yeah, in, in video game music, also, for sure in film music, it's super, super important everywhere. everywhere. Uh, it's really, uh, yeah, because th- th- this is how they're going to participate in the in the structure of the of, of the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, two more tracks. We've got Armored Core for answer. Someone is always moving on the surface. Armored Core Six was just recently announced for all major consoles, um, and uh, it's a it's actually from Soft, but before they made uh, the uh, the Soul series. Oh, so this is another. So, is it? A, it's a Miyazaki thing. Is or. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't remember. Cause I, this, these came out when I was very young on the PlayStation. And, um, so it's the same, same company that did them, but possibly not Miyazaki and his team. Is that- oh yeah. Miyazaki later directed armored core four and it's direct sequel. Yeah. Armored core Four answer. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. so it is Miyazaki. And actually, so Armored Core doesn't play at all like like Dark Souls. It's hard, apparently, but it's not. It's like giant mechs. Think like the world is over. AI and humans are you, it, it, same brain. There's a lot of story bits that I'm missing. So, But that's the general aesthetic. But this piece really struck me because a lot of the other tracks are very like, are very like, pop like 90 synth almost so like with like but like with an element of the vocalism is kind of like off the wall it doesn't fully make sense it's kind of intense it think like mm, like rock it's it's very strange but this particular piece as a person who come, came up in the classical music world really struck me um but someone is always moving on the surface but it doesn't necessarily sound the way i expected so Yeah, Su- surprising. No, not at all when you're when you describe this kind of the general, you know, mm-hmm. the general mm-hmm. name. This was not what I was expecting. 
Well, and humanity has been driven under the earth, if I recall correctly. And so someone is always moving on the surface. I think it means like the mechs are traveling over the surface of the, of the land, but there is nobody else around. And so it has this strange melancholic quality to it that I, that I find hypnotic in the way that Philip Glass would be, you know, it has this very. It it exactly made me think a little bit of um, uh, Philip Glass, uh, Probably a little bit more Philip Glass than Steve Reich, but certainly this sort of like this minimalist school uh, of, uh, you know, having a having a figure, repeating it, repeating it, and then sort of changing in this sort of kaleidoscopic way what's what goes around it. Yeah. Did, yeah. What was that? What was that? There was that film that one really famous movie that that Philip Glass wrote the music for. And I think was it. Koyana Skatsi or something like that. That oh, I don't know. Um, it it had a it had a Japanese. Uh, I, th- I think it might be Koyana Skatsi, which was, and I think the word meant something like um, or means something like life out of balance. And really, and it so it, it he he used a similar. Well, I mean, obviously, really for, uh, very emblematic of his style, and it had this sort of like meditative kind of like uh, mm-hmm. you know, groove to it as we were watching all these images of like uh, of basically humans. And like, yeah, I th- think th- th- there'd be like an image of like, I don't know, sausages getting made or something. And then like the, the next image is like humans walking through turnstiles to get onto the Metro, like sped up or something like that. So oh, like, oh, oh, oh. The, the, <laughs> I, mean, I haven't seen it in like 20 years or something like that, but, but th- this music sort of evoked a similar kind of uh, feeling to me with the, it, it is strange that minimalism can touch the spirit that way. You know what I mean? That you still can connect to it and relate to it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's not a music that really, uh, that I have much experience with as a, as a performer, certainly not as a conductor though. I have, uh, I did play a couple gigs a long time ago of like Steve Reich music for 18 musicians. I don't know um, if you know that piece at all, but I don't, but that's, yeah, yeah. That's pretty Music for 18 musicians, for me, this was really like the sort of baptism of fire for me. It was, really, it was because I was a little bit resistant to this music, and I had a friend who was deeply into it and who, who was trying to get me into it. And he thought that the best way to do that would be to, uh, he invited me to play in this piece in a concert he was organizing. Oh. And it lasts about an hour. It's, so you really have to get into the, yeah. get into it. Yeah. And that, that was the best way to, you know, to feel that. I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. It's uh, th- there's a lot of ways to to structure music. You know, we in we in in sort of opera and symphonic music. I think sometimes we can get a little bit too um, focused mm-hmm. on this is this is the way it is. This is what we do. This is this is how it should be, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but there's, it's a it's a big world. There's a lot of ways to to make good yeah. music. Well, the final track before I ask you piercing questions about your experience with, with listening to video game music is uh, a, a, a very famous one. This is, this is a performance actually by the Game Music Collective. It's called One Winged Angel from Final Fantasy VII. This was uh, the first piece of music that I ever heard that drew me to classical music. Uh, obviously, this isn't the original 8-bit version. This is a fully orchestrated version. They go on and they do this frequently at their Distant Worlds concerts. They, it's usually the encore or the finale of, of things. It's it's a, it's it's a famous, famous piece. It belongs in the symphony hall with uh, other choral works that are happening at the same time. I mean, it's it's truly a, a transformative piece. And uh, I'm excited. For, you've never heard it, right? You don't know One Winged Angel? Final Fantasy VII, One Winged Angel theme. No, I, I don't know anything about I only know the name Final Fantasy.
They always do this, this clapping thing. so fun and it translates so well to orchestra it's insane it's insane how orchestra I mean, it's it's and this is from a composer that's not classically trained at all the orchestra looks like they're having a blast i know <laughs> right so, so how does the audience know to all start start clapping at this at this i moment? mean this is the they, quintessential video game piece it's the quintessential they, they, know, they know the game so they know oh, the yeah 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 the, yeah, yeah. When you when you fight this, so this is Sephiroth's theme at the very end of the game, and you first you fight this version called Bizarro, which is giant, and it's it's not hard. And then you think, okay, the game's over. I beat the first phase, and, and as you know from some from soft experience, this never first phases are never quite final. And the second phase, he becomes this angel sent from heaven, but he's really like the Antichrist, and so this theme plays in the eight bit version, you know, it, it, it is, it's a visceral experience. It certainly was for me as a young person playing this. And I remember my mom was like rushing me to like finish. I'm like, no, oh my God, this music. What? Ah! And it's the first time that you have this like, sort of like creepy, you know, you hear it. It's like a dance at one point, you know, it, it, it like kind of goes through the mentality and the confidence and the strength of Sephiroth and, and like the, the brutal rage in there too, but it's like elegant at the same time, you know, oh my God, it's, Ooh, so good. Yeah, yeah. I think from soft, uh, it does seem well based on my very limited experience. Uh, th they do this extremely, extremely well, right? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, there's a few of them in Elden Ring that really, that really, pretty much blew me away. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, even though I started to get used to it, and the idea that uh, is there going to be a phase two for this one? Is this good? you know, and kind of, uh, yeah. but um, and some of them are really incredibly. Uh, uh, successful, I think, like the Millennia fight, of course. Um, uh, Malekith as well. There's, you know, there's oh, a yeah, few yeah, yeah. extremely, extremely strong. I, I, I gave you the the orchestral one uh, in the like live performance because you know I felt like that would most like connect you to what you know what you do now and and it's it's sort of it's, it's, i mean what's your perspective of a piece i mean that piece is like you know generational like it's uh it's like this seminal video game like must know piece you know yeah i guess it must be uh you know it's why well, it comes exactly from the time period where you know i only i played video games when i was quite young and then sort of like i started to rediscover it a couple of years ago but it, i'm extremely you know once once I start to play something, uh, I really have to, you know, play it a lot. I, I sort of have that slightly obsessional thing. So I, it's the same thing with uh, TV series. I, I really haven't seen very many because once I start watching one, you bitch. watch yeah. the entire thing. And there's only, you know, we, uh, we only, there's, so only so I, there's, there's only so many hours in the day. It's true. Um, 
I guess, you know, to end this, coming away from this, you know, based on your experience, like, has this changed your perspective of video game music on the whole? Uh, well, I get it's changed it in the sense that now I, I have a m- much better, uh, I mean, I've discovered a lot of stuff today uh, and a lot of different uh different approaches to it. And, and some of it I would need to understand a little bit more to kind of the, the context to fully, you know, even if I, I well, I liked the, the piece, but the context would, would help sort of add into my appreciation. And then there's a couple of them that are also like uh, Bloodborne in particular really made me want to, you know, go find a PS4 somewhere. And like, <laughs> like, well, I sort of knew this, I'd heard this and, uh, you know, a friend had, you know, suggested to me as well, ah, if you really, if you like that game, then that's what, you know, then you would probably really love that. But anyway, we'll see. Maybe, maybe yeah. it's up. Do you think, do you think that you would program video game music in a concert along with uh, Beethoven or, or like uh, Shostakovich or something? I'd have to give it some uh, to give it some thought about what kind of I mean I do I love the idea of mixing up some genres as long as yeah. it's it, it's got to be done it's got to be done well uh, yeah. and which is one of the reasons why I mentioned that concert of the the film music concert that we did because one of the composers that John Williams takes from well, actually two of the composers that he takes from from really quite a bit are Korngold and Holst so yeah. I thought it was. I was really pleased to have the idea of like, yeah, we're going to end up with John Williams, but first we're going to hear two of his heroes and his models. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has a through line. prototype, and then we're going to hear how he transforms it into the Imperial March. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I would. I need to kind of know more in order to construct a program that 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 makes those kinds of links, because then then it makes sense in a concert hall. The, mm-hmm. the, you know, and I think that yeah. the. Then we also participate in that thing. What, what you were mentioning about the, uh, the the barriers, basically, and avoiding that sense of like, okay, we've done your stuff. Now come here, our stuff. So maybe more important is to figure out a way, you know, figure out a program that kind of has it like, you know, it's it's all it's all music. It, yeah, ultimately, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. true. Well, maybe we can expect Germán the first hunter on. Uh... <laughs> See, who knows but i want to i want to know more about this <laughs> about this character I really and I, I guess lastly I, I think i already know the answer but was there a piece today that really struck out that stuck out to you oh yeah yeah for sure bloodborne but uh <laughs> um you know i'm gonna I, i'm gonna learn more about this <laughs> There you go. There you go from self fans. You got another one. Although he, he sort of already was, but now even more so. Yeah, so now no, he's I mean, really in the deep end. Really. I mean, Elden, Elden Ring really did, really did blow me away. And, uh, and Dark Souls 3 also was really fantastic. And someday I'll get good enough to play Sekiro. And yeah. then, you know, but I, I do see why. And, and also I learned a little bit about that, that sort of world and some of these like absolute, uh, maniac streamers who do, who who do these who do these like these soul level one runs and the, like oh this, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of this i, I mean, have yeah I, I don't know how they do it um i mean i uh yeah i guess i i, I have an idea of how they do it it's just i can't i just can't possibly <laughs> conceive of getting good enough to actually do that you know so. <laughs> playing playing dark souls with like a potato launcher or like dance pad or something like uh, or like you know it's random stuff oh like my, that oh my god i think it's, i i heard of somebody who yeah who played elden ring on a on a dance pad and like yeah and, yeah, and yeah, beat yeah. It. how how on earth but I and <laughs> um but in order to even you know I, uh, to to beat millennia i had to be pretty like you know Pretty, pretty leveled pretty considerably, you know. It took me and six hours. That uh, you know, that's that that was no joke. But man, that was a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then well, another, another thing that's fun about those games is getting to go in with your friends. Then later on, and just you know, and, stomping. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, Robert, I really appreciate it. This is a very long, very long. I think this is the longest one, uh, two hours and 50 minutes. Of course, we chatted a little bit before we started, so that's not the full uh, accurate time. Yeah, we catch up as well. It's it's really great to see you, and it's great to share this. Thanks so much for uh, for inviting okay. me on. Of pleasure. course, of course. And everybody, if you want to check out more, uh, feel free. I'll link Robert's uh, website down below. And if you're in France and want to check out an opera, definitely check out Opera de Limoges. And yeah. uh, 
or anywhere else really it's 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 great and uh yeah thanks a ton robert and uh see you everybody bye see ya